Madam President, High Commissioner for Human Rights, ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor on behalf of the government and people of South Africa to convey to you, Madam President, and members of your bureau, our collective gratitude for your excellent stewardship over the business of this council. But let me also immediately thank all those over the last week that, in fact, heard about um, that President Nelson Mandela were not too well. I can safely say that your prayers has helped that Nelson Mandela, in fact, has been released from hospital over the last two days. On the 8th of January this year, the African National Congress, the ruling party of my government, turned 100 years old, making it the oldest liberation movement in Africa. At the core of this struggle for many decades, being our people's right to choose their own destiny as a united, non-racial, non-sexist society. I therefore like to thank once again the progressive partners who during the dark days of systematic socio-economic exclusion of South African people were resolute to support our country in its quest for universal justice, rule of law, self-determination, and human dignity and equality. We are sharply, however, cognizant in our country of the triple challenges of poverty, unemployment, and inequalities, which continue to afflict our society and for which urgent interventions are required. Since 2009, the current administration has been systematically reviewing through a 15-year review process government policies with a view to strengthening in order to mitigate the aforementioned triple challenges. Some of the key interventions in this regard include integrated food security strategies, the zero hunger policy, social security safety net, nutritional food programs for school children, expanded public works programs on infrastructure development, and declaring 2012 a year of infrastructure development to create decent jobs. In our steadfast efforts of building a better South Africa, a better Africa, and indeed a better world, we seek to do more to ensure the promotion, protection, and fulfillment of human rights and fundamental freedoms for all. Madam President, the Eurozone crisis has brought new financial challenges and threats to global growth, to global peace, and to global development. We face the prospect of declines in global trade, falling industrial demand, delays in investment, liquidation of business, and stressed financial institutions. This time, with the added risk that fiscal austerity in some parts of the world, which will extend the slowdown and deepen the crisis. The crisis currently reflected in the Eurozone is having negative effects on the global economy, including our own. And therefore, our country remains committed to initiatives that are intended to ensure that the right to development is a reality for all. In South Africa, we have the African Renaissance Fund in line and in line with its mandate to advance the economic and social development agenda for Africa, and have decided to disperse funds in support of the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, and therefore um, we've made recently interventions in, um, to give support um, for humanitarian aid in Somalia, Madagascar and a few other countries. Madam President, there has been a universal consensus about the possible challenge by developing countries, especially those in sub-Saharan Africa, to meet the Millenn Millennium Development Goals targets by 2015. Most notably, it has been observed that the main challenge in meeting the MDGs is in relation to the health-related MDGs, i.e. Goal 4, reduction of child mortality, goal five, improve mat maternal health, goal six, combat HIV and AIDS, malaria and other diseases. The paramount question of mobilization of requisite resources for the developing countries to achieve the MDGs cannot be overemphasized. The G8 and other developed countries have a responsibility to discharge their solemn pledges and commitments in order for Africa to achieve its MDGs. My country hosted the 17th Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention of Climate Change and the seventh session of the Conference of the Parties serving as the meeting of the parties 
to the Kyoto Protocol in Durban from the 28th November till the 9th of December 2011. Africa and other small island states are under heavy pressure from climate stress due to, amongst others, current low adaptation capacity, making them highly vulnerable to the impact of climate changes. Unless this is effectively dealt with, climate change will have a dramatic impact on the realization of fundamental human rights and indeed reverse the progress that has been made so far towards the MDGs. The outcome of this conference include an agreement to implement the packets to support developing nations. This means that urgent support will be available for the developing world, especially for the poorest and most vulnerable to adapt to climate change. Madam President, the MDGs recognize the need to promote gender equality and empower women to participate in all facets of economic and social life with the aim of achieving sustainable development. Climate change poses a significant challenge to the achievement of sustainable development for the poor, especially rural poor, and especially women, who will suffer disproportionately from its impact. It is therefore critical that more is done to mobilize and empower our women to address global environmental challenges such as climate change. Madam President, the commemoration of the 10th anniversary of the Durban Declaration and Program of Action adopted at the 201 World Conference Against Racism was indeed a historic event for the international community to recommit itself to the effective and full implementation of this milestone. And let me therefore say that we were quite disappointed that there were some countries that effectively paid lip service over the last 10 years to the implementation of that particular declaration. Let me reiterate that the issue of political will remains at the core of this thematic area. As you may be aware, South Africa attached great importance to the issue of the elimination of racial discrimination in all its forms and manifestations. It therefore is against this background that my government has committed to hosting the African Diaspora Summit later this year, which will bring the international community together to galvanize support for developing the agenda for the promotion and the protection of the rights of people of African descent. Madam President, my government is working currently on the National Trans Traditional Affairs Bill, which makes provision for the recognition of the First Nation, the Khoi and the Sun communities, their leadership and their structures. It is important to remember that the Khoi and the Sun people, who are indigenous to South Africa, were one of the most brutalized. As a community, their language and identity was undermined to an extent that the entire community was nearly extinct. This, therefore, this legislative process is an example that seeks to substantively and progressively address the legacy of colonialism and apartheid. South Africa is committed to the process of strengthening protection mechanisms for victims of violence based on sexual orientation and gender identity within international law. We therefore look forward to engaging with a panel discussion on the subject on the 7th of March and the outcomes thereof. Furthermore, South Africa is undertaking a number of domestic processes to protect victims from violence based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Madam President, the events which are collectively known as the Arab Spring are some of the vivid reminders of how deep-seated are the challenges envisioned by the architects of this august body. My country calls for a genuine as well as a constructive dialogue and deliberations on these and other worrisome challenges, followed by steadfast, proactive and effective multilateral actions to give credence to the letter and spirit of the International Bill of Rights, which seeks to protect humanity. My government also has noted the release of the final report of the Sri Lankan Commission of Inquiry and Lessons Learned and Reconciliation. Our government commends, therefore, those for the decision to set up an authoritative, authoritative mechanism to further investigate allegations related to human rights abuses and encourage decisive action upon the findings. The pot partiality in which some international bodies are perceived to respond to situations of human rights abuse in different parts of the world is for us, however, problematic. 
Some countries continue to enjoy the protection by certain forces, even whilst gross human rights violence against their own neighbours is continuing. It is the responsibility of this Council to ensure that this type of selective application of the definition of human rights is being stopped and that all peoples everywhere in the world are protected from abuse. The Government of South Africa welcomes the reconciliation agreement between the Palestinian community um, on Monday, the 6th of February 2011. It is noteworthy that this reconciliation has taken effect in a climate of ongoing regional tensions. A Middle East process hampered by continuous disagreement and the as yet unfulfilled establishment of a Palestinian state. South Africa congratulates the two parties and will support all attempts towards democracy, peace, stability, the advancements of human rights and human dignity in their society. We remain deeply concerned about the political, security, socio-economic and humanitarian situation in Syria that continues to escalate. This despite calls from the international community for the Syrian government and the armed opposition to remain, to refrain from the violence and settle the difference in a peaceful manner. South Africa believes that the efforts of the League of Arab States should be supported and given the necessary political space to find a solution to the Syrian crisis. South Africa therefore supports the effort of the League of Arab States to facilitate a Syrian-led political process as stated in the resolution. In conclusion, I would like to reaffirm my country's support of the work of the Council, its effective functioning, as well as the fulfillment of its mandate. I thank you.